Good morning and welcome to St. Andrews on this lovely morning. I'm so happy to see so many of you returning. And this is a great Sunday for you to be returning because it is Rally Sunday. And for those of you that have been around here forever, you will remember Rally Sunday from years ago when we used to meet in the CE Hall after the service and see displays of all the different groups. Well, because now we have two services, that display setup is downstairs in the uh, chapel and I invite all of you to go to the chapel following this service and enjoy the uh, refreshments downstairs as well as taking a peek at what's going on here. You may have seen in the bulletin things that you didn't know really what they were. Well, hopefully downstairs today, those questions will get answered. So if you don't know what Fellowship Kitchen is or uh, learn and serve, check it out downstairs and you'll find out the answers. Originally, today was to ha have a finance meeting following the service, but that has been rescheduled to next Sunday following the service. It'll just be a 10 to 15 minute uh, congregational meeting for anyone who wishes to stay and, and uh, ask questions about the finances that the finance and property trustees have been working on. Uh, there has been an announcement in the email and on the bulletin for several weeks now explaining what is they're trying to do with our finances. So it, that may have brought questions for you and so next Sunday is the Sunday to get those answers. We have a rummage sale coming up and that is November 4th so make sure you mark that on your calendar. But prior to that on October the 21st, we have Harvest Happening. And for those of you that don't know about Harvest Happening, although I can't imagine there's anyone in this church that doesn't know about Harvest Happening, it is our wonderful bazaar that we uh, have uh, on a Saturday from 9 to 2. And there is everything you can imagine and want uh, on that day so if you are one of those people that makes preserves or you sew or you knit you knit get working on those things to offer for sale for our bazaar and then make sure you come on on the 21st to uh, to take in all the the displays and the things that are for sale and the wonderful lunch that will be prepared uh, I think perhaps that is the most uh, most of the things that I need to mention today. Uh, just a reminder though that next Sunday, October 1st, is Orange Shirt Sunday. So I'm hoping to see, I know all of you won't be able to do it, but it would be nice to see a sea of orange out there if, if you are at all able to do that. Let us worship God. Thank you, Matthew. Beautiful way to start the service. Beautiful music. Welcome, everyone, to St. Andrews this morning. So great to come for worship, to see you all, as we are the people of God, the body of Christ. And its church is so special in the sense that it's an intergenerational event. All of us come 
different ages, of course, and uh, we have diversity, and God bless you as we support one another, pray for each other, and encourage one another each day. Hear the call from God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please respond with me. It's, I will be the one, and you be the all. Our call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. And we will call on God's name and make known God's wonderful works. Seek the Lord continually. We will watch and listen for signs of God's grace. Together, let us worship God. We will rejoice in God's presence and praise God's holy name. Amen. Shall we sing hymn number 368? It let Christian faith and hope to spell. If you'd like to follow from the hymn books, you can do that. Otherwise, the words will be on the screens. Please be seated, everyone, and welcome to all of you to worship today, and a special welcome to those who are worshiping online. And uh, if you are brand new, this may be your first, or you've come a few times, and you haven't signed the guest book, we want to encourage you to do so uh, at the narthex of the church. God bless you as we worship together. And uh, let me lead you in prayer, a prayer of adoration and confession. God of all creation, you open the world around us and fill it with creatures of your love and purpose. The wonder of each creature declares your praise. The mountains state your majesty, the ripened field your generosity, the oceans your power and the skies your grandeur. Birds flying aloft sing of your freedom, and the tiny ant works with your persistence. And what do we declare about you in our lives, Lord? We pray that our work will honor your justice and mercy, and our relationships speak of your love and your compassion. So may we praise you, O God, not just in this hour of worship, but in all our waking and our working. May we live your praise and promise through Christ our living Lord. God, you are the giver of all good gifts, yet our generosity is often limited. We complain about our lot. We compare ourselves to others. 
and see what they have that we lack. We share some of what we have, but we worry about running short. Forgive us our worries about tomorrow and give us generous hearts that trust in you day by day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the declaration of forgiveness, the assurance of pardon. The mercy of our God is from everlasting to everlasting. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, God's generous love reaches out to embrace us. In Christ, we are forgiven and set free to begin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. So now it is time for our children's song. And uh, the Bible recipients, please come forward at the same time, and you know who you are. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. That fits right in the scripture today. Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. Do not worry because we know he loves us even greater than the lilies of the field. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to stand beside Lori and I'm going to... Just have her speak into the microphone. Okay. Well, this is a, a pleasure to be able to do this this morning. Uh, for those of you that have been here for a while, you know that um, in, in September we always present Bibles to children who are entering grade four. However, we have very, been very lax and neg negligent during our time of COVID, and so we have some Bibles to catch up on. So the first Bible that I'm going to present is actually for uh, someone entering grade four, and, and that, that is William. So William, congratulations on entering grade four, and here is a Bible for you to enjoy and, and learn more about God on your own. Now, uh, the next person that we're going to present a Bible to is uh, Ellie, 
and Ellie, we know that you're not in grade four, but in grade six, and uh, we are very happy to present this Bible to you, and we apologize for it being so late. Our last Bible is going to be presented to Joelle, and Joelle uh, is in grade eight, I believe, and Joelle uh, wasn't here uh, when he was in grade four, but we are so happy that he has become part of our congregation, and actually he works often in our sound booth and is uh, a valued member of our service. So Joel, here is a, a different Bible for you. It's not a children's Bible, but it is the, the message. Wow, this is special. You guys, do you have the Bible? And um, it would be good that you read the Bible um, kind of on a regular basis. And for all of us, the Bible is really important for us to help us with our life. And even every day to read even a little bit out of the Bible is really helpful. Let's pray together. And I will pray and please repeat after me. Dear God, we thank, you we thank you for your word in the Bible. Lord, please be with all the children today and the youth as they learn more about you through the words of the Bible. Thank you for your love that never fails. Amen. Amen. So you guys can go to your classes. Yeah. Today's scripture reading is Matthew 6 verses 25 to 34. It's about do not worry. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who seek all of these things, and indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is the word of the Lord.
Thank you, choir. Now, as a former teacher, I, I will ask, what was that song about? <laughs> Being exalted, exalting our God. And how are we doing that in our life? Are we exalting other things? And uh, I think we're all guilty of that. Come back to church and we're reminded again that God needs to be exalted. Yeah. So today, we have our piece of scripture that is well known. Do not worry, right? And we admonish each other every so often and say, don't worry about that. That's such a stupid thing to worry about, right? I mean, has anybody <laughs> said that to you? It's happened to be, right? Of course. And I have to say more than once. And we do. We worry. Um, there's uncertainty in life and so on. But we worry about not having enough, being enough, looking good enough in the sight of others. And um, we don't belong to them, right? We belong to God. And it's about trust. We get worried about so many things in this life. And we're going to talk about the difference between concern and worry as well in a moment. There's a psalm, Psalm 23, that starts like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then it goes on from there about how the Lord is our shepherd and so on. And that's what Jesus wants is for us to trust in him, to trust in God. Let's come to our God in prayer. Dear God, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts together, be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, does anybody know where this piece of scripture comes from in terms of the Bible? Yeah, it comes from Matthew 6, right? And Matthew 6 is part of the Sermon on the Mount. As, uh, and it uh, starts, Matthew 5, with the Beatitudes. And then um, Matthew 6, verse 25 to chapter 7, is this piece today about not worrying. And Jesus, before he starts the teaching on not to worry and to trust in him, he has the whole thing about concerning treasures, where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. What you look for through your eyes, right? And then serving two masters. You can't serve two masters. You can only be loyal to one and disloyal to the other. You can't be just focused on the one. And that happens in our lives too, right? We kind of put Jesus on the periphery so often because all the other things are so important and then we kind of sprinkle a bit of Jesus over top to give us comfort and we can get into the habit of that instead of serving Jesus and from the center of who Jesus is in our lives we attend to all those other parts in our lives rooted in Christ so there's we're talking about fear and how fear can constrict and mobilize us, right? And there's such a thing as healthy fear as well. I shared in the first service that, you know, when I started working with my dad every summer, uh, painting exterior houses in Brampton, Ontario, the exterior of houses, rather, then I remember the first jobs in these old Victorian houses with all the soffit and fascia and eaves troughs that had to be scraped and painted and putting the ladder up and always a little bit scared. And that would be the beginning of July. Yeah, Jamie's just going to the washroom and then he'll be back shortly, so yeah. So then I made sure I really set my ladder well. Right? And then, in the second week, I kind of gained confidence and, and it became quite normal. Uh, 
but we do have those fears that are good because sometimes I have to hang off the eave trough and I got to make sure it's nailed properly if to get around the corner and to paint a piece that only spiders, as I said to my dad once, would, would see. <laughs> but you never know, you know, you're looking around a corner and there's a missed part, right? So, oh, we have healthy fears. You know, don't stand too close to the road as you're off on the shoulder because the cars are going past fast. Water can be too hot for the bath, um, etc. We have healthy fears that keep us safe, right? And our brains respond to danger naturally through a center of our brain or part of our brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is the part of the brain that most closely, is a closely rather, associated with fear, emotions, and motivation. Its name, amygdala, actually translated means almond because it's almond-shaped. The amygdala regulates our emotions and is the alarm system of the body when danger is near. So Jackie and I were watching a movie the other night, and uh, there were some dramatic parts. And you know, as people kind of walk outside, it's dark, because they heard a noise, you can expect there'll be some kind of surprise, right? So this person goes around a tree and somebody is there, and then Jackie went, oh, like this, and I kind of went, oh. Like, <laughs> we react differently to different things. But that's Jackie's amygdala was just more active than mine at that point. Maybe I wasn't paying attention enough. So it's our alarm system. It cautions us of danger, which is an amazing part of the human body, right? Our peripheral vision, we see something coming without really seeing it, but we know it's coming, and our, we're, our amygdala tells us there's danger coming, there's something coming towards us. The body is an amazing thing, and it keeps us safe. But in anxiety, we activate the amygdala on a regular basis when we have irrational fears, unhealthy fears of trying to control the future. And we can't. And the amygdala becomes activated, and then it becomes a habit to become more activated and then we can be in a more stressful situation. So in spiritual formation, we want to develop habits that are healthy, holy habits that bring us closer to God, have Christ more the center of our lives through prayer, through meditation, through going for walks in creation, of course, for meeting together as a people of God in the church. And the more we practice these spiritual practice, our body becomes used to it. Our brains become used to it, and it becomes more natural. And we're formed more natural in the way of God. With anxiety, we can be formed more natural towards fear, right? And in the Christian faith, we want to be formed more towards hope, right? Because that's what Jesus wants. The difference between worry and concern. Concern is seeing a problem and trying to find a solution of things you can do. Okay, so it's, it's about planning, right? And it's really important that we are concerned about our future, planning for events and so on. But worry is projecting disaster into the future and creating anxiety in things, as I mentioned, you can't control. And uh, we call it sometimes overthinking as well. Have you ever been accused of overthinking things and getting stewing and stuff and becoming anxious? What if this? What if that? It's important to be concerned, <laughs> but then it becomes dysfunctional when we irrationally overthink things and we become fearful and it becomes a bad habit. From lesser to greater. And this is a theological concept that we find in the Bible 
in Jesus' ministry. And in, as we read in Matthew chapter 6, our scripture reading for today, we read this. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Okay? They are fed through the natural environment, through God's creation. Beautiful creation that we have that provides that. Are you, and this is the important part, are you not more valuable than they and can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. And I was looking out my window this morning, and uh, our wetlands, um, the colors are turning more quickly. And, man, you, you can't not praise God and say, wow, is that ever beautiful, all the reds and oranges already in the wetlands. So it's beautiful. The lilies of the field, we heard the song this morning coming out of this scripture. But the concept, theological concept of lesser and greater goes like this. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Okay? The beautiful creation that we have, the beautiful colors, right? God provides that, but we are the crown of God's creation, right? Why are you worried about it? God provides that. How much more will he give you what you need? O oh, you of little faith, Jesus says after that. You see the beauty, but God treasures you all the more. You're the crown of God's creation. And Jesus says, think of it this way. What will we drink? What will we wear? Theologian Jürgen Moltmann, he's one of my favorite theologians. He's 97 years old. And uh, he was born before World War II. He was born in a family that was... Um, Secular, you would call it. They really valued philosophers like Nietzsche and so on. Education would have been a, a, a huge thing in their upper middle class life. Jürgen, who was a teenager, was really impressed with Albert Einstein. And he wanted to become a mathematician. He was geared towards that. Then the, the war broke out. He was 18. He was drafted into the army. Hamburg, his home city, was bombed terrible. Tens of thousands of people were killed. His friend, who was beside him, was killed. He saw huge suffering. Then he was transferred to the front, and uh, he surrendered himself to the Allies. He was brought to a, a camp prisoner of war camp in Belgium, and then later in Scotland. And he just found there, there wasn't a lot to do. But the people were, were good to him. And one of the prison, or one of the uh, camp chaplains gave him a Bible. And because there wasn't a lot to do, and he was a bit of a student, he started reading it. And he came upon the part where Jesus was on the cross. And he said these words, Lord, why have thou forsaken me? And he saw in Jesus, became clear to him that if this God is love, 
then this God has to suffer because in love there is suffering where you put yourself aside for others. And if God is love, he needs to suffer. And he saw Jesus suffering on the cross. And when he said these words, Lord, why have you forsaken me? He felt totally connected with God. Because even God in Jesus, as he read in the scriptures, suffered. And connected so well with humanity as, because we say that, don't we? Say, Lord, why have you forsaken me? God, where are you? And when God could say that himself, God knows our pain. God knows our suffering. And God knows what we need. Supplies all our needs. And then, willingly gave his life to push against the justice and the hate, the injustice and the hate in the world took it all on his shoulders, died, and then when he rose from the dead, the resurrection gave him hope. That story, math-oriented, systematic theologian he became, brought life and connected the suffering to God. And we rose from the dead. He defeated all that stuff so it doesn't have the final word. And he could go on with hope. And in an, in an interview with Miroslav Wolf, who is another systematic theologian, he said this, hope is anticipated joy. Fear, worry, is anticipated terror of what might happen, what people think about me, that I will have enough, that I'll be in pain where hope is anticipated joy because we know our God is a God of love, willingly fought against the powers that be of injustice and hate, inequality, and connected with us because he said, Lord my God, why have you forsaken me? This God gives us hope and rose from the dead to defeat all the pain and suffering. He wrote two books, or more than two books, but the ones, um, A Theology of Hope is one of them, and The Crucified God is another. And Miroslav Wolf asked him the question and said, how do you see God? And he said, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't believe in God. Jesus is the face of God, he said. And it's important that we, we remember that, the hope that we have. So hope anticipates joy because Moldman says that Christianity is a religion of joy through the cross and the resurrection because we can go forward knowing that we're given eternal life, that he will make all things new, and we can bring that knowledge into our lives right now. So that's hope. And that joy that God is always, always with us gives us that joy in spite of the pain and the suffering and the loss that we are feeling. He went on to be a theologian. He didn't become a mathematician anymore. But he said it was the most wonderful adventure of his life. And it is. We don't know everything. But this matters. This matters. And it surprised him. He didn't expect to see who Jesus was. All he saw was pain and suffering. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. That hope anticipates joy, right?
And once we have that joy, we can deal with all the other stuff in life that isn't <laughs> that joyful. It doesn't mean you have to be happy all the time. And we'll talk about that in a second. On verse 34, we read this. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. I'm going to just play the refrain, and you can sing along if you want. Some of you are already humming, I think. It's, it's wonderful how music kind of sticks with us, eh? One, oh, let me get the words in front of me. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking of you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Let's do it again. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking of you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Beautiful. <laughs> There's uh, at least two verses with that, eh? I think, so you can look it up on the internet. Worry and concern is an opportunity for prayer. And let's face it, we worry, we're concerned. There's uncertainty in the world. We hear it on the news. We, terrible things, right? With the climate, with the division between nations, hate, injustice, war. But we have worries in our own life. And even for concern, we're concerned about something, it's important that we pray about it. We just don't pray if we have worries that constrict us, immobilize us. But we are to pray. And I think there was a line in one of the songs of, of pray all the time. We are called to live a life of prayer. And especially when we worry and have concerns. Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I want you to look at it this way. And Jesus is saying, do not worry. He's basically saying, look at it this way from lesser to greater. Look at it this way, that when you get a worry, you have an opportunity. What? I don't want to worry. Okay, we're going to have worries. It's an opportunity for you to pray. I'm worrying. Okay, I'm going right to prayer. I have a concern. I'm going to go right to prayer. And we know, as Paul writes, that God will work all things out for good. And when we pray, it's not like all our concerns and worries will be fixed, right? But what happens is you're acknowledging, as Jürgen Moltmann, the theologian, would say, you're acknowledging the presence of God, which is already there, okay? And you're allowing it to come in and to give you peace and help you deal with God's love 
for what is ahead. And not only that, not just coping, but empowering. And that's what the Spirit does for us. So don't worry. We have to do these practices that create spiritual growth, spiritual formation. When you worry, when you're concerned, hey, time to pray. And when we're in our families and somebody says, oh man, this is terrible. And you think, yeah, this is really bad. Let's pray. Let's give it over to God. Don't worry about your life. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Thanks be to God for his word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's time for us to sing Simply Trusting Every Day, 689 in our Book of Praise. Yeah. Please remain standing as we pray for the offering. Dear God, we thank you for the abundance that you give us. Lord, work into us a heart that doesn't see things, the world, as scarcity, but out of your abundance, Lord, you provide for us. We pray, Lord, that these gifts that have been presented through your body of Christ here at St. Andrew's Owen Sound Lord, go to the advancement of your kingdom through the work of your church. And Lord, let love come through as these gifts are given and as those receive these gifts. Let your name be glorified. And Lord, let your joy be enriched in us 
as we give for what you have first given us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Please be seated, everyone. It's now time for our congregational prayer. And I have a few special prayer requests at this time. One of our members, Adele Armstrong, um, has indicated that her daughter-in-law, Jenny Armstrong, is in chemo for the next six weeks, five days a week. So we just want to hold Jenny up in our prayers and her family as well. Also, uh, Jamie McNabb, one of our members, uh, his good friend Andrew is dying of brain cancer. And uh, we just want to hold Andrew up and his family up in our prayers as well. Also want to um, mention to you that one of our members, Norm Maneri, died yesterday. And I was talking to Helen, and um, the date and time of the visitation and funeral is still to be determined. It will be, I understand, close to the end of the week. Um, but uh, it'll be posted on the website or through the email. And um, we will have uh, plans for that hopefully today. But it'll be less than a week from now. Let's come to our Lord in prayer. God of mystery and wonder, we look around at the beauty of the world and sense that you have given each precious thing its place and a way of sustaining itself. Thank you, Lord, for your attention to the details of creation. But even more so, Lord, you care for us, we who are the crown of your creation. Let us remember that you provide. You provide our needs. Yet we also, Lord, we see an aching world and sense that many precious things are under threat. Bless the work of faithful people everywhere to care for the climate and the environment. Show us how we can protect what is at risk for the health of your whole creation. God of energy and life, we look around at the people of this world and see your imagination and dignity in every variety of face and culture. Lord, thank you for the gifts you plant at the heart of humanity. Yet we also see the aching of the hungry and the hurting and hear the groans of parents whose children die in their arms and the cries of children who fear tomorrow. Bless the ministries of our church across our country and around the world and bring healing and hope, Lord, to lives at risk. God of possibility, of promise, we look around at the places where people collide with each other and hear the grumbling of nations locked into old rivalries and new grievances. We watch the justine of leaders impressed more by polls than effective policies. God, we worry about the future of our communities and our children. Work through us, Lord, to provide relief, knowing that you work through our efforts, through our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for the ministries of advocacy our church undertakes and the witness for justice and peace in Jesus' name we make together. God of faithfulness and surprise. We look at ourselves and sometimes doubt we can make a difference or have an impact. Challenge us, Lord, to recognize the kinds of power we do have the power of love and compassion, the power of courage and commitment, of laughter and friendship, of generosity and mercy. In all these gifts, we know your power at work within us, Lord, and among us. Call us to keep serving together, knowing, Lord, that through your Spirit, we support one another, help one another, and work for the kingdom together. Lord, we pray for those who are ill, at home, in worship, or in the hospital. 
Lord, we pray for healing for them. Give them your peace. Give them your healing power for the healing they need, Lord. We pray, especially, Lord, at this time, for Jenny Armstrong, who is undergoing chemotherapy. Lord, we pray for healing in her body. Lord, work through the doctors. Let your Holy Spirit be with her. Help her remember your presence. We hold her up and her family, Lord, at this time. Let them know your love for them. We pray for Jamie's friend, Andrew, who's dying of brain cancer. A young person, Lord, we, we hold him up. Let his heart, Lord, be open to you. Give him the healing he needs, Lord in his body and his soul. And God, we pray for his family. Strengthen them at this most difficult time. Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We think of the Maneri family with the loss of Norm. We're thankful, Lord, that he doesn't have to suffer anymore, that he's with you. He has that promise for eternal life. He's your precious child as we are all, Lord, your precious children, dearly loved and beloved. Lord, we pray for Helen. Strengthen her as she's lost her life partner of so many years, the one she loved. Lord, give her the strength she needs. And also, Lord, be with Carol Sue and Jennifer Ann, the children. Lord, bless them. Give them their peace as they have lost their father. Lord, let the assurance of the promise of eternal life rest in all of them. Give them your peace at this time, Lord. Let them know you are near in life and even in death, Lord, for eternal life. Dear God, we trust in you. Help our faith to grow through your spirit, through our church, our congregation. And Lord, we are blessed by your grace as shown through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. And shall we say in one voice, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It's now time for us to sing our final hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, number 315.
Lift up your hearts to God, receive his blessing, and go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship, the communion, the guidance, the love of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you always this day, tomorrow, the day after that, and forevermore. Amen. Just a quick reminder, it's Rally Sunday today, and if you can possibly go downstairs to the chapel, that would be wonderful. And refreshments, I understand, are there as well. God bless you. Have a good week. <laughs>